Okay, so welcome to lecture two of ECE 53. So what we're going to look at in this lecture is we're going to build upon what we talked about in the last lecture. Um, so, so initially, we, we started off talking about um, random variables and how they're in various components of a digital communication system. What we're going to do now is take this one step further and, and really try and reflect class a random phenomenon that we will probably experience system which we refer to as a random process. So what, what, what is a random process? Well, a random process, we have the definition written down here. So a random process is a rule for assigning to every outcome of an experiment a function that varies with time t. So um, if we bring that up onto the board here, what do I mean to say? So let's go back to random variables. So a random variable, what we had is we had that lima bean space omega, and we have an outcome, a little omega, and it gets mapped by a random variable x, which is x of omega, to the real line. That's great, okay? So, so essentially, every point, so let's say that's omega 1, that's omega 2. So omega 2, that would be mapped using that rule over to, let's say, that's x1, and that's x2. Now, what a random process, so that's a random variable, a random process, or RP, what it does is it's taking this lima bean size space, and you have these spaces. So let's say you have omega 1 and you have omega 2. But instead of mapping it to a single point on real line, what it's doing is it's, it, there's also a time component. That value changes potentially over time. So it's a lot more fun. So what essentially you have is, let's say we have this guy, and, and, and essentially this guy maps to this function, time domain function. And this point maps to that function stuff. And that, that's not a function because there's more than one intersection vertically. But suppose I'm drawing a little bit more neatly. And so what we would do is we would have x of t. There's a time aspect. And this would be time. And here, these would be values, right? And it would be mapping both outcomes and time. So over the mapping or the, 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 the representation of that outcome numerically would change, right? And so we call this a random process. And what's interesting is there are several things to note. Um, so you might say, okay, so I'm mapping to a function, so it's deterministic, right? Almost, except for the fact that I don't, like, let's say if you take a random event. So let's say for a specific time instant, t1. Suppose, okay, t1. Black box, produce me, produce something. I don't know which of the functions with one of those points is going to be selected. So the random, what happens is for a fixed time instant, that random process becomes a random variable. So now I'm not sure which point it's going to select. That's the randomness. On the other hand, if I hold or fix an outcome, right? So let's say I fix this guy, the omega 1 one. It's a deterministic time function, right? So if I, if I fix the outcome, if I say, what is omega 1 over time numerically, it's deterministic. On the other hand, if I say, hold the random process at time t1, give me a value that's random. And it will choose whatever value randomly with a particular distribution at, at, at that time instance. So it might choose omega 1 and therefore this value, or it might choose this guy here. We don't know but it will be characterized by PDF. And the thing is that PDF would change as a function of time. The values change, maybe the rate at which I'm going to select. So, so random processes have so many degrees of freedom that can become very complicated, right? Fun stuff. Case is that um, a lot of folks, let's, let's, let's rein this in a bit. Instead of having this, this like, you know, like the, 10 headed dragon type of scenario, okay? And the goal is to try and kill it by chopping all the heads. So you got three, but then the other one. When we, let's look at a particular subset 
of random processes. Um, so we have something called stationary random processes. And I don't mean stationary as paper stationary. No. So stationary, stationary means that predictable behaviors statistically across time, across values for that random process. Right? There's something called strict, strict sense. It's good if you do that, if you're a communications engineer. It's very bad if you're flying on an airlines and you have that on your boarding pass. Because I remember having that in London, and what that translates into is the extreme. Extreme as in, they take your bag and they take all contents out and everything. And, um, and you almost miss your flight type of thing. But if you have in a communications sense, mm, that's perfect. Because what strict and stationary just means is that if you on that random process, and then you shift time instant, the random process should have the same, like you, you should essentially have the same statistical distribution at those instances. So whether you're um, at this time instant, instant, that time instant, that time instant, the statistics of your random variables at those time slices of that random process should be the same. There should be some, some sort of consistency. And then you might ask, what is the random, what is the mean of a random process? Well, it's going to be the individual mean of every random variable across time. So it's actually going to be called the mean function. And I don't mean mean function as in is a very angry looking function. It's mean function as it, it's a function of all the means across time. Yes? Oh, okay. So, so what happens? Okay, so that's an excellent point. So the question is, why in the expression here for strict and stationary, I'm actually indicating multiple time instances? That's an excellent point because there's something called joint distributions. So, in a very simple case, let's say we have just a very one-dimensional distribution, and you shift it over time, they they should be equal. Now, there's something. Let's say I have like two different time instances of a random process. And they can be jointly characterized by a joint PDF. So what that means is if I have two points on random process, that's essentially two random variables, how do they interact with each other in two-dimensional space? So, so what ends up happening is so when we have a single random variable, you have like the, the, you know, those curves, right? The, so you have an you essentially have an X and a Y and then a Z. And the Z carries value. Then if you go all the way to K, we're talking about K-dimensional space. And then it's the relationship. What is the probability of getting X1, X2, X3, X4, all the way to XK? Characterization. And then the mean of this thing, uh, we, we just very simple Now, and correlation of a random process. So again, this actually comes back to that same point about why do we have multiple, like, you know, relationship. Let's, let's actually draw that. So like, I'm just going to start anew. So, let's, so what's really interesting is the random process. So suppose we have, let's, let's draw this in jumbotron mode. Okay? So we have T. Okay? Let's say we have another guy here that actually decreases. Okay? So let's say that corresponds to omega 1, omega 2, omega 3, and omega 4, right? And so that's time. And so these are one of four possible outcomes of my random, random process. Okay, so this is a random process. And so we know that if we fix at different time instances, so let's say that's T1, T2, T3, 
what we have is essentially three different random variables. So essentially, x of t1 is a random variable, and we can choose with, with and there, it's characterized by PDF at that time instant, what is, like, you know, what is the likelihood of getting omega 1, omega 2, omega 3, omega 4, right? One of those four functions. This is x at t2. This is x at t3. So, so what happens is if we do, let's say, the mean function like what I described, and let's see if I can use the color feature of this fancy technology. What happens is the mean function, the way it's going to look is essentially I take the average of all those four functions. So I get something that, oh yeah, it does work. Ha ha ha. Looks something like this. So this guy here is mu of t. It is the mean of all those possible outcomes distributed across time. So mean function. But it's not an angry function, okay? <laughs> now, suppose I want to know um, the, what autocorrelation means, in a nutshell, is how much of one signal is influencing another one? How, how, are, how are the two connected? How are the two, um, in time instances, coupled? So if I want to find out what is the autocorrelation function of a random process at two time instances, what I'm trying to find out is what is the relationship between these two guys? How much of one, uh, one time instance of a random process is influencing the other one, right? So that's, that's where this autocorrelation definition comes into play. Nope. So, it, it so essentially, what we do is we take our expectation or uh, expectation operator, the E. And what we do is we take the random process instant T1 and fix the time instant T2. And we multiply the two together and take the expectation that what, what it does is, essentially, if you look at it from a vector perspective, what you're doing is you're doing a dot product. You're taking, essentially, the vector that represents x t1 and x t2, and you're projecting one onto the other. You're basically saying how much of one is contained in the other. That's the correlation. But because these are random, we have to use the expectation operator in order to of that behavior, right? So, that's, so mathematically, we get this ugly look double integral type of expression, and that f x t1, x t2, x1, x2, this is two-dimensional joint PDF, uh, the relationship statistically between x1 and x2. So the, 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 the um, blah, uh, sort of the, 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 the basic math behind this. Now, um, if this is strict sensationary, we go back to that. And so strict sensationary means that any time shift or any time instant it will have, and then the joint distributions, if it has shifts and stuff, it should all be the same. So what should the mean function be? Boom, constant. How about the uh, correlation? The autocorrelation should only depend on the relative difference between the two time instances. Beautiful. So, so what happens is, um, we have this, all this great math, and then autocovariance is pretty neat too because it's only, but if you have a non-zero mean random process, you subtract off the mean. So we're, now we totally unbias our calculation because the mean could bias things. Let's say you have one, at one point the mean's very high and the other point the mean's very low. Let's subtract off the mean altogether to get just centered at zero, right? But, um, you know, the strict sensationary situation as it sounds often. I would love it if, like, let's say this, this particular process totally can be characterized, even if I shift the joint probability density function to another time instant or a time shift. Often happens we have another type of stationarity property called wide sense stationary or WSS. There's another one which we will not talk about too much, not too much in this course anyway, called cyclostationary, where the, uh, the, sta the property um, is actually periodic, right? So the co correlation function actually um, has some sort of periodicity associated. But wide sensationary is very basic. It's, all it is is your mean is a constant, and your autocorrelation function just depends on the relative dif di time difference, not the absolute one. So if, let's say, I take my 
two random, uh, take a random process, two time instances, and then let's say I shift them both by the same amount, uh, so, so some c uh, seconds later, but the spacing is still the same, it has identical autocorrelation. So the correlation just depends on the relative time separation between two points on the random process. So Widesend stationary only has those two properties. And this is very powerful stuff because this will simplify math like no tomorrow. Right? All right. So what we're going to do now is we're going to do wonderful stuff that we've talked about. And what we're going to do is we're going to now do a little bit of uh, my favorite thing, which is let's apply this to an LTI filter or linear time invariant filter. So you might, might not remember what is linear time invariant. So uh, that actually might, might be another cool doodle to, to draw. Okay? So linear time invariant. So it combines two properties, uh, linearity and time invariance. So what's linearity? So linearity is, let's say if I have a x of t plus b uh, y of t, uh, no, let's, let's do x1 of t and x2 of t. And then I feed that into some system, h of t, and it's, li it's, a, li and it's a linear transformation. What should end up happening is that we should get at the output um, a y1 of t plus b y2 of t. So we should basically get, um, if we have the sum, weighted sum of inputs, we should get the weighted sum of outputs, right? Now, the time invariance, is also very interesting because what happens is if I have a shifted input, so let's say x of t fed into a system, gives me y of t. That means if I have x of t um, minus tau, feeding it into a time invariant system, should give me y of t minus tau. So a shift in the input gives me the corresponding shift in the output. So linear time invariant, or LTI, is the combination of these two properties. Right? And that's powerful stuff. All right? So what happens is, in this case, system, uh, h of t, and we have, as I drew, the property up there. And so what I'm interested in is, suppose I feed in as an input now this random process to a system. I want to know. What's really cool is every digital communication system that you're going to deal with um, can be modeled as a bunch of these blocks and, um, well, I wouldn't say it would necessarily linear. Some, some, some blocks may not be linear. But for the most part, a lot of the blocks we're going to be playing with in this we're going to talk about how do you create um, uh, different types of modulators using impulse functions and LTI systems and pulse shaping filters and, and, and the like. In this case, what happens is if you have um, a There's hope. So what do you do? You convolve. Ah, no. People don't like convolution, right? But suppose, like, mathematics kind of wrote it out, um, what convolution is. So uh, essentially, you take, a, uh, this is continuous time convolution. You take your h of t, you convolve it with x of t, your random process. You can also, like, so, so there's several things that you can do. The first thing is, what is the mean? of the output of that LTI system. And all it is is you take the expectation operator, apply it to y of t, and it turns out that let's replace y of t with this integral expression. Now what so, so what happens is you have e of the integral of this product of two functions, um, and the integral is applied across d tau 1, switcheroo. Let's bring the expectation operator to the inside, right? 
So I can say, OK, the E now switches places with the integral. It now is applied to the argument, the, the, what we're trying, the integrand of the integral. And then what is random? Is the LT LTI system random? Nope. The only thing that's random is this zeroes in. So what happens is because of the property of this deterministic LTI system, because we're convolving, because things are linear, we can actually do all this nice cool math and, you know, uh, you guys can try that. Maybe, maybe try it on this cool technology of yourself if you want. So what ends up happening is now that we have this, um, we also can do the same thing with the autocorrelation. The autocorrelation is the same thing, lots of gory math. But it's this exact same principle. This course, just like with my 502 course or any course I usually teach, you can usually do everything from first principles. Use the definition. So the autocorrelation of, in general, of, of, of a random process, it is essentially take the product of, let's say, that random process x at time instant t1, multiply it by the random process x at time t2, and take the x the expectation of, what, what, sorry, what is the autocorrelation of y at t and u? It's going to be the expectation of y t times y u. Plug in the definition for y t and y u. It's that convolution integral thing, right? Plug that in. And what you're going to get is a double integral expression, but the same thing. Expectation of double integrals. Each integral is a linear operator. I bring the expectation inside grand. What's, what is random in that? The two x's multiplied by each other, right? And that gives you the autocorrelation function of x. So again, exercise for a student. If you want to be put to sleep tonight, you can solve this. You know, doesn't take much to put me to sleep, so. Okay, so why is this important? And the thing is LTI. Modulation schemes, everything can be represented by an LTI system, filters. So this course is beautiful because it uses these very fundamental concepts to analyze very complex, complex systems. So, and why do I talk about LTI systems and stuff? Because I'm, I'm building up to sort of the punchline of this lecture tonight. And that punchline is power spectral densities. Oh, power spectral densities. People ask me, what do I see? I see spectrum, OK? Which, you know, a lot of people still think it's kind of scary. Like, I don't tell that to my wife. I don't say, yeah, I see spectrum. No, no, no. But, but what happens is, if you're a communications engineer, spectrum is your best friend. I, I had almost the exact same conversation earlier today in the lab for my undergraduate course. It's like, if you want to understand what a wireless signal um, or what's happening out there. You've got to look in the frequency domain. Time domain will tell you some things, but really it's what's happening out there in terms of the frequency domain. How are people existing, operating, signals, interacting with each other, the noise, the energy that's being communicated by that signal. Frequency domain. So why is frequency so important? So everybody should know what about the Fourier transform and what Fourier said about periodic and aperiodic signals, right? That any aperiodic signal can be completely characterized by the complex weighted sum of complex exponentials, which are actually by Euler's relation, a bunch of sinusoids, sines and cosines added together. So, and each one of those sinusoid, like sine and cosine, has a different frequency. So that complex weighting process Okay, at this frequency, I'm going to weigh this sine and cosine, um, one of which is imaginary, with this complex weight. And at that frequency, I'm going to weigh it with this value. And at that frequency, I'm going to weigh it with all those sines and cosines weighted like that. Added together, we get these unique times. Okay. Being, like, you know, being the cool uh, French uh, scientist that he is, said, okay. Actually, happen to be the energy contributions. Power spectral density, the name, power. Density. 
and density. What it tells me is that the power spectrum of P is a waveform tells me how the energy across all those different frequency components of sines and cosines that represent that time domain signal. What happens when the signal is periodic? We get Fourier series and coefficients, right? So Fourier thought of everything. Continu Continuous free time do that, right? He's covered all the bases. And then you have things like the imaginary. There's also there's a there's a real bias to it as well, and that's where you get S. And what happens is that's the difference between, let's say, controls folks and communications people. So how many people here are like robotics or controls or any of that sort of person? A little bit. Oh, yeah, that's right. You're, you're. But, but so, so if you do controls, everything's Laplace transforms, right? Bode plots, pole zero plots, and stability, all that jazz, right? Well, do we care about Laplace? No. All we care about is the frequency contributions, right? So, so just throw away. The, 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 that, uh, that real term, and we only keep the frequency term, right? And then, the, and then the controls people say, oh, that's so easy. You only have to worry about one, the imaginary frequency, you guys, you know. You know. So, the, what, the most important transform. So the Fourier transform actually screams how to get this um, frequency a Euler relation. So Euler's relation says complex exponential. It can be represented by cosine a half. Uh, yeah. Hmm. No. It's represented by cosine plus j sine of that frequency, right? So that's where our complex sinusoids come in. Right through the complex exponential, and so and for c and that instant multiplied by that time instant of that signal, and we sum it across all frequencies, we get the frequency representation. You can go back to the time domain, right? So. We now go back. Let's put up. Let's 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 go back to the math. I know everyone loves math here, right? And we apply now the Fourier transform and inverse Fourier transform to that last expression that we saw before with the autocorrelation function of the output of our transmission. What we see is that if we do all that nice math, and what's cool? So the Fourier transform, integral, is a linear operator. We can move that inside along with the expectation along with the other two integral expressions. And what we get, ha, ah, is wonderful. I love this thing. This thing is going to come back in a few slides from now. What we get is essentially the average of the square of the random process at time t is equal to the integral from minus infinity of the magnitude squared of the transfer function of the LTI system passing input signal um, x of t in, and then multiply that by this. That's our power spectral density of the input. But this is that the average mean squared value of the output, okay? The, the average squared value of the output, mean squared uh, average of the output value, the integral of our spectral density multiplied by the, the magnitude squared of your transfer function. So what happens is power spectral density, if you integrate it from minus infinity to infinity, gives you the power of the signal, right? But it's being function at the output. 
further, as we'll see a little bit later, there's some really powerful stuff here. Okay. So let, let's look at the properties of the PSD. Okay. PSD, and, 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 and this is really cool. What happens is there's something called, called the Einstein-Wiener-Kinchin uh, Einstein relations. Okay. And what these relations do, so EWK relations is the following is they relate autocorrelation, which we can calculate in the time domain, and the power spectral density in the frequency domain by a Fourier transform. And if we want to get the autocorrelation from power spectral density, inverse Fourier transform. Cool, right? Beautifully directional. There's some really cool properties, like number one here. What happens is, integrate from minus infinity to infinity the entire autocorrelation function with our spectral density at cool how about if we take the Average the expectation of the random process x squared t. Okay, what us? that is essentially the mean squared value of a random process. I'm integrating the power spectral density. I'm getting the power that's equal to the average power of my random process. Right? Makes sense. Power the density. I should get the value. Right? All PSDs should be greater than or equal to zero. So if you have a negative power Talk with me. Maybe we can submit a Nobel Prize or something, right? And last but not least, I actually know one, there's one. Power spectral densities are symmetric, but only for real valued scenarios. If it's complex, if you have a complex random process, which does exist, scary enough, what happens is you don't have symmetry, but if it is real value, what happens in the negative frequencies of your power spectral density should be identical to the positive side. So nice symmetric curves. Ah, beautiful. See, now I can say that. <laughs> Property number five. And this kind of these properties, which is that the, 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 um, we can actually describe a form of probability density function. Okay. So if the power spectral density, when normalized, possesses properties usually associated with some sort of probability density function. But in this case, it's like over f, over a frequency. So essentially, what we have is a normalized power spectral density. And that tells us um, it's like you know, some sort of density function, if you will, like the likelihood of each frequency occurring okay, across f. So I'm going to sort of you over the head with a few good examples. This one is actually not from the textbook, surprisingly. You might say, which source did you get it from, Professor? So Simon Haken, so he's from McMaster University. He's about, um, he, I, he's about yay tall, I think. He, like, in the photograph you see online, he's like, you know, bow tie. But this guy is phenomenal as an as, as educator and a researcher in terms of, he does a great book on like adaptive signal processing. He has a very good book on communication systems engineering. Good reading material. But he has us some good uh, solved examples. So let's, let's look at a few, OK? So if you ever get his, his digital communications, his, no, his communication systems engineering book, it's really great. So this is the first classic one. This is a classic power spectral density question. Find the power spectral density if, you're, if you have a, the following random process. So we actually didn't look at random processes too much. So let's see. So it's the classic. I'm going to just bring it up onto the board. So let's say your random process. So how do you get a random process? So it's usually x of t. Let's say we have a constant amplitude a, cosine, so that's a deterministic function. Let's say it has some sort of frequency, 2 pi f c of t. All of that's deterministic. And ah, here's the randomness. That phase, remember? 
So and let's say all phase values are equally likely to occur. What should that say? That means uniform, right? So it's uniform. So this guy here is uniform. And let's say he has uniform phase um, from minus pi all the way to pi. So the question is, find S x of f. Okay? Yay. So it's actually several steps. Step number one, find R x of tau, assuming it's white and stationary. So there's actually, so that's a sub-step. So just make sure it's WSS. And how do you do that? Part one of that sanity check is that the mean function is equal to a constant. And the second part is that this guy here, his autocorrelation function, is only equal, is only affected by the relative time difference between t1 and t2 and not the absolute. So once you get that, then step two is take the Fourier transform of r t tau, and that, folks, will give you S x of f. Straightforward, right? So, so I, okay, one is a really big step. I should have thought this out a little bit more carefully. Maybe if I redid it, the first thing to do is, okay, find out, is it white and stationary? So there's part one, part two. Then, if it is, yay, find out what the autocorrelation function is, r of tau, uh, r x of tau. Then, part three, r spectral density. Yay. So if we go back to our derivation, so first of all, we know that um, let's let's assume this structure here, this step one, and we know that by definition our autocorrelation function will be equal to the expectation of x t plus tau times x t. Right? There's a time difference of tau between the two. Now, if we do that. It turns out that it's going to be equal to, and I, I left out some math, um, it's going to be equal to, uh, the autocorrelation function is equal to a squared divided by 2 cos 2 pi fc of tau. Now, I skipped the part, I skipped several parts. So the first thing I skipped was, um, uh, like, first of all, like, how did I get to that final answer? And the thing is, I used a trig identity. So if I, if I return to that, so do, 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 do. let's go to new. Two. So if I multiply cosine 2 pi fc of t plus this guy, right, times cosine 2 pi fc t plus tau plus again, the theta, the random phase. Now, what this essentially becomes is this becomes the argument there is A, and the argument here is B. What we've got is a cos A, cos B scenario, right? So, so what happens is we need to use trig identities in order to solve it. And now what happens is if you use the trig identities, uh, to expand it, what you're going to get is that will, some will be double frequency terms and some will be, and so what I mean by double frequency terms. So if we expand this out using those trig identities, what will happen is you're going to have some cosines and sines that will have things like 4 pi, so 2 times 2 times pi, fc, t. You're also going to have tau in there too, and you're going to have that theta. Now what happens is there's something called um, if, if if you have the if what we see here on the slide this guy here this term is because what happens is 
So when you expand it out, and you should try this at home as an exercise, you're going to have, first of all, these terms of cosines and sines, where it's going to be 2 or 4 pi fc of t. And those terms, they will average out to 0 because it's periodic. Then you're going to have those with the random phase. Well, you have a periodic waveform with a uniform phase. So you have equally likely values of phase occurring any time across from minus infinity to infinity of a periodic waveform. That, too, will average out to 0. So those terms will float away. What is left will be actually this 2 pi fc. So I did not solve whether this guy is actually uh, w, WSS, white sensationary, but by, if, if you work it out or by inspection, it should be. And why is that? What is the mean of a cosine function? Zero, right? Ups and downs should be equal unless there's a DC bias. What's the other thing? Is that this guy here only depends on the time difference between T1 and T2. So this guy, in fact, satisfies WSS. Take the transform him, and this is where Euler's relationship, uh, relationship kicks in. It's easier to integrate the cosine here in terms of complex exponentials, because you also have a What do you get? So what happens is we group our complex exponentials together. And what it turns out is it looks like a frequency shift, right? Fc and minus Fc. So lo and behold, what is the Fourier transform of a cosine? It's two deltas, right, at Fc and minus Fc. And that, folks, what the power spectral density of a cosine function is. So if any of you play with my spectrum analyzer upstairs or use the software divine radios in room 227, what you're going to find is if you, look, if you use the, 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 uh, the spectrum analyzer block in MATLAB or if you use uh, the spectrum analyzer upstairs and you generate a cosine, right, even with a random phase, you're going to see two tones, approximately. There won't be, they won't look like arrows, but they'll look very pointy. And that, that's our sanity check, OK? Here's another example by Haken. Um, in this case, I give to you this autocorrelation function. It's a triangular pulse with amplitude a squared at its peak, right? So, um, so as a result, power spectral density, how would you do that? You would integrate this guy in parts because you have that kind of, that, uh, that um, what is it called, absolute value thing that, that throws things off. So how would this guy look like? How would he look like? Um, yeah, so this guy, let's, let's draw it, would look like the following. So if we draw it, that all correlation function is going to look like this. So tau from minus t to t, right? And that's a squared. So it's going to be triangular. And so that is our rx of tau. Now, what we want is, how do we get s x of f from that? And the answer is, you integrate in two parts. You integrate first, let's use a different color. First of all, you integrate this section, right? And then secondly, you take this section, ho oh, ho pink dashed lines, and you integrate that, and then sum them together to give you the power spectral density. Ooh, I'm going to love this. So what you end up getting, essentially, is this sort of breakdown. And at the end of the day, it turns out that, that so another way you can visualize it, so you can integrate it in parts like that. You can also, um, just like, just by intuition, so how do, you create, how do you create a triangular wave like that in the time domain? You can involve two rectangular pulses. What's convolution in the frequency domain? It's a product. So if you did it one way or the other, your ultimate answer will be equal to a sink. What do I mean by that? Like, let's, let's, let's see, now I really like this thing. I, I don't know. I'm going to tell uh, the folks at ATC this is just wonderful. So what I mean to say is, let's go back to boring black. If I take a rectangular, no, black. Um, <laughs> there we go. So if I take a rectangular wave and I convolve it 
with a rectangular wave, it's going to actually give me, bless you, it's actually going to give me a triangular wave. And let's say if this is of duration t, and this is of duration t, this should be 2t in width, right? And so what happens is in the frequency domain, what is a rectangular wave equal to? It's equal to a sink, right? And that's equal to a sink. And in fact, what happens is in the frequency domain, if, um, um, if we have convolution time domain, it's multiplication frequency domain, what we end up getting what we end up getting is something called a sink squared. And sink squared is pretty cool because what happens is we have absolutely no negative values. What we end up getting is something that looks like this. Which, remember what I said about power spectral densities can never be negative? Okay. So that, that's how we got um, that, that, uh, that value at the end of the day. If you did it the other way, you would also get it to that point. But if you want the shortcut, you can try it that way. Okay. Example that we're going to look at is we're going to go back to cosine, but we're now going to put a random process multiplied sine with a random phase. So now we have two sorts of randomness. We have a random process multiplied by now a random a function of a random a new random process. So like crazy and wild stuff. Again, same multi-step process. Is it white sensationary? Can we find an autocorrelation function? Take the Fourier transform, get the answer. So if you work this out, so we take the definition. So the autocorrelation function of y will be y t plus tau times y of t, the expression. Make sure that you replace t with t plus tau where it should belong and begin multiplying out. So what you're going to have is you're going to have the product, it actually is turns out pretty nicely. What you end up getting, I think it's easier just to restart this. What you end up getting is, let's say, E. Uh, <laughs> y of t, y of t plus tau. If you plug it in, what you're going to get is x of t cosine uh, 2 pi fc of t plus that random phase, right? And then that's going to be multiplied by x of t plus tau cosine 2 pi fc t plus tau plus theta. And now what happens is you can do something like group, group it together. So you can say x of t, x of t plus tau, and then cosine 2 pi fc of t plus theta times cosine 2 pi fc t plus tau plus theta. Now, what happens is, in a lot of cases like this problem, we can assume that the random process x of t is independent of the phase, which means by property of independence, the function of the random variable of the phase, theta, is also independent to x. So, when you have something that's independent, you can actually take the expectation of the individual component separate to that. So what you end up getting is something that looks like this. So this is a property of independence. So you have that cosine blah, 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 and that cosine blah, blah, blah. And so this is due, due to independence. All right? And then you can treat these piecemeal. This here. Maybe I should use another color. This here is actually your autocorrelation of x of tau. And this here, we already saw what that guy is equal to, right? That guy should be equal to, what was it? Like half cosine um, 2 pi fc of tau or something like that. Is that right? Okay. So that's from the previous example. And then multiply the two together. And that's actually entirely captured also on, on the, uh, the lecture slides that we, we have over here. So let me first put that up. So if you work out all this, this mathematics and you break it down, 
what you end up getting at the end of the day is actually something pretty cool. Because what now if, let's say, we take the Fourier transform of that messy thing? What do we have? So what happens if I take a function and multiply by a cosine with some sort of frequency? What am I doing to it? I'm modulating it. What am I doing with the power spectral density of x? I'm modulating it to fc and minus fc. It's beautiful. And that's what I have over here, right? How did I get that? Because um, what's multiplication in the time domain is if I convolve s of x of f by delta f minus fc, delta f plus fc, convolving that takes that baseband, like, you know, that, that power spectral density censored at zero frequency and, and shifts them to those two frequencies. Here's the last and, you know, my favorite part of the lecture, which is um, essentially how do we the power spectral density between the input and output? And we already saw this a little bit in the time domain, and, and no one likes it. Let's now see, because this is, this is why I think Bar none. This is why I like frequency domain more than time domain. And the reason is, is that it all comes down to this beautiful relationship. So I'm going to cut to the chase because there's a lot of math and, you know, I don't, I don't want to build up sort of crescendo, like, you know, da -da, you know, this is the answer. Let's just get to the answer, okay? And the answer is, it's very simple. If I have an LTI system described by H of t, I have an input random process X of t, and I have an output random process y of t. What's the relationship between the input and output power spectral density? What happens is if you have the input power spectral density, you have the frequency transfer function of h of t, which is h of f. The magnitude squared of h of f multiplied by that power spectral density of the input gives you the power spectral density. And what happens is, why is this so important? Because as you're going to see later, Every modulation scheme, every communication system that you're going to analyze, if I say, what's the power spectral density of binary phase shifting? And it uses a, raise, a root raise cosine pulse shaping filter, and it has this data rate, and all this, you can theoretically derive how the power spectral density of the <coughs> output looks like. You take your spectrum analyzer or my spectrum analyzer from my lab, look at the exact same waveform, and they will be identical. You don't actually need that equipment. It's all theoretical. And then from that, you can do some really cool analysis with, with that. So, so what we've learned in this lecture essentially is random processes, but more importantly, uh, the key um, here is essentially knowing how to, to, to take random processes, random information, and be able to relate input power spectral density and its randomness to the output through a linear time, inver uh, linear time invariant system. So okay, so that concludes lecture two. And, okay, so now it's processing. So what we're going to do is another five-minute break.